Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our session on new opportunities in DNI and how to regain lost ground. We started planning this webinar a few months ago, right when coronavirus hit, um, because we knew that diverse groups were going to be more impacted than others in terms of job loss. And we also knew that DNI initiatives were going to be disrupted as businesses uh, struggled to adapt and survive. Since then, a lot has happened. The tragic death of George Floyd set off a chain reaction in the world. And while the issues that we'll be talking about today aren't new to anyone who has faced systemic racism, it has caused a lot of us to open our eyes and ears and begin to understand the issues in a whole new way. The racism conversation is heavy and it's uncomfortable, but I'm really glad you all are here to have that conversation with us today. We have three wonderful guests on who are all experts in the topic, and I promise that you will leave with at least some idea of the direction um, that you should be going in as a person and as a business leader. So again, I'd like to say thank you for being here. You may not feel quite as zen as the guy here on the slide after our conversation today, but I do hope that we can help you find some clarity for your next few steps in the diversity and inclusion journey. My name is Brianna Harper and I'm your webinar host. I'm also your resource for any questions you have during the session or any time after. We've played about 35 minutes for our panel discussion today. After that, we'll open it up to Q&A. And we'll also have some points in the webinar where we'll ask for your perspective and we'll ask about your strategy, so be ready for that. After the session, I'll send out today's slide deck and a link to the recording. If you have any questions that we don't get to today or questions that you think of after the session is over, please reach out. You can email me at bharper at outmatch.com or find me on social at outmatchhcm. Before we begin, I wanna quickly answer something you may be wondering, which is why does diversity matter to Outmatch and why are we hosting a webinar on diversity? Well, at Outmatch, our mission is to match people with purpose, not just some people and not just privileged people, all people. We believe that there's a path for every person to succeed and we exist to help illuminate that path. We built a digital hiring platform that combines objective data from assessments and storytelling capabilities from digital interviewing um, to ensure that every person gets the consideration that he or she deserves. This type of technology can fundamentally change how hiring is done in an organization, eliminating unconscious bias so that decisions are based on behavioral strengths and fit for the job, rather than the name on your resume or the fact that you may or may not have been born into a family that could afford to send you to college. That's why we're here and that's what we want for the world. Um, we don't have it all figured out. As an employer, we're on the journey just like you're on the journey. I actually came to know each of our panelists through various diversity conversations we've had at Outmatch. I hope that our mission and vision resonate with you and I hope you try out our technology. But for today, I'd simply like to have a conversation as like-minded people who all want to do better. So now I'll stop talking so you can hear from our panelists, um, Aaliyah Hawk, Jennifer Carter, James Pogue, um, and Robin Stencil is also on the call. She'll be moderating the conversation today. Thank you all for being a part of this discussion with us. Um, I'd love to have each of you tell our audience a little more about yourself. Leah, let's start with you. Thank you, Brianna. So as Brianna mentioned, my name is Aaliyah Hawk and I am a partner with the Center for Workforce Excellence. And we are focused on helping organizations have more inclusive cultures. We believe that having an inclusive culture produces better business results and the research actually proves that as well. I've been a part of this diversity and inclusion conversation for over 35 years and I really am um, excited to be on this call today to really um, to push the envelope a little bit and James will talk a little bit about his his uh, podcast about being uncomfortable and I think as professionals we're all likely in a spot of being a little bit uncomfortable but that's where the change happens so thank you for having me absolutely thank you Leah Jennifer over to you hi everybody uh, my name is Jennifer Carter I am president of executive women's forums international EWF international 
We're a leadership development company based in Dallas. Uh, we are focused on increasing the number of women in the C-suite and in business ownership and throughout the ranks. Um, we do that not only because it's the right thing to do, but also as Aliyah mentioned, um, it drives business performance. Um, diversity at all levels drives business performance, financial performance, the ability for companies to innovate, pivot in times of great change and crisis, which we may or may not recognize at the current moment. Um, and we, I'm, I've been passionate about this for a number of years, and I am thrilled to be here and be with such an incredible panel. So thank you for the opportunity. Sure, Jennifer. And for anyone that attended um, our webinar on leading through anxiety, you'll recognize Jennifer. She was on that discussion as well. So I'm really glad to have you back. Um, and James, welcome to, uh, welcome to the Outmatch webinar series. If you would please introduce yourself. Sure, my name is James Pogue, and I have the opportunity to, uh, to talk to people about diversity, inclusion, and bias. Been doing that for a while now. I'm grateful for the opportunity to join Outmatch on this podcast and really share what it is that I've learned and uh, also learn from the from the panelists that, have, that are joining us. The work that I do is really focused on, as Aaliyah said, keeping people in that right place of uncomfortable, to be uncomfortable, but to learning and doing so, not to be uncomfortable for the sake of being uncomfortable. It's a great time to teach and to learn and for all of us to grow together at our own pace. I'm a firm believer that we are, wherever you are in your diversity journey is okay, but staying where you are in your diversity journey is not okay. It's a great time for us to learn and to gather together. So I'm grateful again to Brianna for gathering us and putting us in a position where we can share some information, a little bit of what we've learned with some really interesting and hopefully curious people. That's great. Thank you, James. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got Robin Stencil from Outmatch. She's going to be moderating the panel discussion. Uh, Robin, please introduce yourself. Hi, thank you. I'm Robin Stenzel, Chief Solutions Officer with Outmatch. Um, I get the honor and privilege of working with people like Brianna every day. I also get to work with our customers, our product team, um, and my background is in HR, so it's a great way to bring all of that together and be able to bring different solutions and really more importantly, different conversations as it relates to talent and topics and how we really enable our businesses through people. So I think this is a very timely and important conversation um, and ways for us to really hopefully improve our businesses and also the communities in which we live. So excited to be part of it. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Again, thank you, Jennifer, James, Aaliyah for being here with us today. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to you, Robin. Let's get started. Great, thanks. We're gonna start with a poll question. Normally when you see us with a poll, we give you some answers and you get to pick one. It really gets you started thinking this morning and so challenging you a little bit um, about why you're here. Um, we know that there's, with recent events, um, particularly as we think about the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, as we think most uh, recently about Rayshard Brooks, those have really brought to the forefront this, um, the fact that we have social injustice and systemic racism in our society. And so it's also caused our businesses to think we need to do something different, we need to do more, and we probably need to act faster. You know, many of us have had diversity and inclusion plans for many years, but maybe when we look back, that, that impact and that change hasn't been where we want it to be. So now as we start to think about this, as we start to do things different, I'm curious, what caused you to say, now I want to come in, I want to learn more, and I want to be part of this conversation? So what brought you here? And if you would just go in and chat those in, that would be great um, for us to be able to hear. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll reach out to our panelists who have such great experience. They're out having these conversations with organizations like yours. Um, and maybe you all can each sort of share, as you've been out and having conversations, what are you hearing from businesses? What are they trying to accomplish? I guess let's start with, I'll go with Jennifer. She's on my left. I'm going to make my way along. <laughs> So we've been having many conversations, uh, not only around COVID, but also the the social unrest and the the, the uh, conversations around um, institutionalized racism. What they're challenged with is doing it right, um, getting it right, being concerned about getting it wrong. Um, and and the council you'll hear today, and and James mentioned it a little bit early earlier and said it very well, um, is that you know. You are where you are in your journey, but you can't stay there. And uh, the conversations I've been having with colleagues and friends and clients have been around embracing that, that discomfort, embracing that exposure and vulnerability, 
and pushing into those spaces anyway. I like that, embracing and exposing. Great, thank you so much. Aliyah, how about you? So I've seen a mixed bag. Um, there was actually just a couple weeks, uh, actually it was the day that the George Floyd video just you know, went viral. I was doing some focus groups with the technology company. And shortly after those focus groups, they just went on fire. So they got very vigorous in their action. They were ready to go and they were like, we've got to do something about this because they had done an employee engagement survey and knew that there was an issue. And now this was like the perfect time for them to really just go all in. So they were, they are demonstrating that they are committed and they are wanting to contribute to um, this long time challenge that we, that we're facing. There have been some other organizations who unfortunately are not that ready. And because it's such a sensitive conversation, they're not willing to jump in because it is difficult. But like James said, you know, you're, you're somewhere on the journey, but staying where you are is at this point, it's kind of just not permissible. And um, that's strong language, but we really are talking about people's lives and livelihoods. And we're really talking about a system that is, it's expired. And we know in business, when things expire, it's time for a change. So I'm seeing a couple of different um, ways in which people are engaging. But if you think about people and companies and how leaders run their organizations, leaders who tend to be more um, you know, courageous and going to get after it, they're going to show up that way. And leaders who tend to be um, less in that mode, who may want to listen a little bit longer, or who some may just want to avoid. Um, I think we're seeing it all, actually. It's interesting. I wonder if, if you think about that idea of sort of being out, leading, being courageous, and avoiding. I wonder you know, if you think about not just as we talk about this issue, but in general, how does that impact the overall health? I think this has a huge piece of the overall health of your business. But then if you combine this with everything, right, those that, that might be something as you think about your business, how do you get it healthier? It's a great point. And I, I really, I like the idea when you said it's expired, I, I immediately went to like, I've got stale milk in my refrigerator and how do I get anything better in here? You know, or, or just, you know, bad fruit, whatever that is, it's time to get it out and put something back in. So I love the, that that term expired, I think is really powerful um, to, to your point. I'm seeing a lot of this uh, reflected in the answers. We're getting several answers, which yeah. is awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing um, what you're trying to accomplish with us. So I'm seeing, you know, always learning. I'm seeing several answers around, um, you know, we were interested in DNI and we've kind of got this, we've accelerated this. I'm on a council. We've got an initiative. Um, I think that's what we'd expect. So um, yeah, let's let's turn it over to James and see what he's seeing. Yeah. So I would say two things. One, with, particularly with leaders, it's hard. This is hard work. It's it's heavy lifting. And for those of you, those of us that aren't in the kind of shape, right, that we need to be in, you got to get to the gym. And that means you got you need you need somebody that's going to help you out and help you get fit as it relates to this. And and there's a lot of help that's out there. There's a lot of really smart people that are raising that are raising their hand and saying, "Hey, I will help you do this." So you're not out there by yourself. Yeah, it's really really hard, but it's very accomplishable if you do the second thing, which I've heard a lot about, which is you're gonna have to be in this thing for the long haul. There 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 is no magic dust that people can sprinkle on you and say, "Woohoo, it's it's fixed." And and to Leah's point, this is the the expiration date has passed. And so you have to begin to do something now that is long term. And so as you're thinking about solutions, your solution is unlikely to be a webinar or two. It's unlikely to be a, a, a uh, an ERG group and some information they give you. you that's, those are good things, but that's not a comprehensive uh, solution to a systemic problem. It is hard. It might be a long term solution. And if you're not committed to doing those to those two things, then I would challenge you and say that, are you committed? And not because you're a bad person necessarily, but a new lens on what commitment looks like, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking not two months, two weeks, three months, a quarter. We're talking about how are you going to change the guts of your organization? And if this is a time for courageous leaders to jump out there and do the unknown with a lot of help. And there's lots of good help out there, lots of really solid people that are out there to help you. 
but you got to be committed to the long haul. It's like you, if you want to lose 37 pounds, you start by showing up at the gym and with a trainer that's going to help you out. And you can't start in January and quit in February and expect to have any results, right? We got to be in this thing for the long haul. Let's hold some hands and jump off a cliff together uh, with a parachute. <laughs> there's, there's another answer I want to call out because, you know, this is a conversation we're having as business leaders, but also as humans. And so someone wrote in, I also have two little girls and I want to take action for them. So that's certainly a piece of, you know, it's, it's everything. It's, it's definitely not uh, siloed to one aspect of life. That's great. James, you said something and it made me think about a conversation we had before this. You said, you know, if you want to lose 37 pounds, you got to get to the gym and start to do it and you can't quit and you've got to do this. The 37 pounds, you've got that goal. Like, so where do you want to go? What are you trying to achieve? And how do you sort of sort of start to articulate that? And I think kind of in our early conversations when we were starting this, um, and I think when we first met, we sort of said, even beyond the training program, hey, we want you to take us to the, if our goal is to run a marathon, we want you to take us to the race. And you said, great, but why are you running the race? Mm -hmm. right, what are you trying to do? And what is that goal? And what does that look like? And I think I said to say to you that I got to get back to you because I've got a few questions of my own that we've got to go answer. So I really appreciate that setting the goal and the intention. And then to your point, it's going to take a lot of hard work to get there. So um, lots of great experiences you can see from our panelists and the work that they're doing. I'm so excited to, to dig in a little bit more and then also kind of connect that back to the things that you all are trying to um, learn and accomplish as you're part of this, this session. All right, so let's maybe tee up with another question. Um, oops. So as we think about this, and, and I'll pose this to our panelists, you know, as we think about what are the deep fix, so we've talked about there's, there's these problems, and, and James, you you mentioned it, Aaliyah, you touched on it, Jennifer, as well. This isn't new. This isn't something that's that certainly came up because of COVID or because of, of the recent deaths that we just talked about. This has been in our society for a long time, and it's a problem that exists in business as well. It's not just something that we can separate. This is my personal life, and this is my business life. These things have become intertwined. Um, and as you all have kind of started to, to well, it, in your journeys, not just today and not just recently, because you've been doing this for a long time, what are the deep, deeper systemic problems that you see in businesses that are causing us um, you know, a little bit we talked about it not to do something, but but what are those problems and why aren't we acting faster? Why don't we stick to our, I'm going to turn it to James first, why aren't we sticking to that regiment and that plan when we've set a goal out? Or maybe we haven't set a goal. Yeah, I, I think that there is a lack of basic understanding. And so I, it, it's, it's a tough thing to say out loud because it questions who we are and, and where we've been and that we haven't been learning the right things. So I, I really try to provide grace in my comments and in my thinking that just because you don't know, that's okay. You know, uh, I don't know you. So you don't know because you don't know. You In fifth grade and 15th grade, you weren't taught some things. I wasn't taught some things, right? And so it, we didn't have the opportunity to engage in discussions that where the topics, uh, the, the, the term systemic racism is the result of a variety of things. And we were taught those variety of things over time. And so now we're being forced into a situation where in a very accelerated way, you're being asked to learn something that's very difficult, very emotional, and something that's been hidden, either purposefully or otherwise, from us as learners. So. It is a, a challenge. So, so I, you gotta. We have to put on, as my mom would say, put on your your your, your big girl underwear or your, your, your big guy underwear, and then you have to go to work. So we have to uh, engage in that. Just recognize first off, this is gonna be a hard journey. So it's, it, that's okay. But you have help, as I mentioned before. So when I think about what some of the systemic issues are, the first is that there's a lack of education, lack of basic education. The second piece I would say, as I, before I turn it over, is that we have to be careful to whom we go to get the information we need to take the next steps. Everyone it may be willing to be helpful, but everyone doesn't have the knowledge necessary to help you. And that's not, again, that's not on them. They didn't know either, right? And so if we go to the wrong, uh, the, the wrong portal to get the right information, we inevitably will get the wrong information, right? So we, if, I, if I go to my black ERG group, to have them teach me about all things black, perhaps I'm going to the wrong knowledge base, right? 
Just because you're black doesn't mean you know all things black. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you know all things woman. You want to go to somebody whose job it is to teach you, to help you how to understand this information better. And both Ali and Jennifer have such deep roots in this. And so I'm interested, obviously, in learning from them, but also in pushing you to engage in folks like them so that they can be helpful to you in your journey. I like that. And I, I appreciate the fact when you said, you know, if you've got the problem, don't go to, if it's a, if it's a female problem, doesn't mean you go to some, to all women and sort of say, can you solve this? If it's something that you see, you don't go to, to everyone who's black and ask that. I mean, in conversations um, that I know that I've been having within groups, people I know have said to me, I'm tired because I am black that people are coming to me and wanting me to be the educator and the cheerleader for this. I am processing my own feelings and emotions right now. And I don't know that I have all the answers and I don't want to have to be put up as the person with all the answers. So I really appreciate that, that you brought that out and, and said that it's who's the expert. So we're going to keep turning to experts because that's not me. And I'm going to turn to Aaliyah next and see what, what her perspective is. So when whenever someone is going through something, it's very important to notice and name it. You know, it's something that's a phrase that gets tossed around quite a bit. You got to notice and name. Um, there's also a framework that a colleague who I follow uses quite a bit. It's awareness begets choice, choice begets responsibility. And I loved it, but I felt like something was miss missing. And the thing for me is action, right? So awareness, choice, responsibility, and then action. So if we kind of put those two concepts together with noticing and naming, and then I'll talk about noticing and naming first, and then we can talk about action. Part of the noticing and naming is really naming this thing. So what is the deeper systemic issue? The deeper systemic issue is white supremacy. And we're not talking about people with you know hoods on and all of those things. And actually in a call that Jennifer and I had, she shared a beautiful definition of it, which was the measure, white supremacy is the measure that white, the level of excellence is whiteness. And if you think about that, it's like, yeah, that really makes sense. And if you take it a little bit, uh, if you go just a step further with it, it really is about cisgender white men. That's the level of excellence. There's a uh, there's an exercise that we do, and part of it is about you know how do you, you it's about bias and stereotypes essentially, and without fail, the positive or negative stereotypes that get assigned. The only, the only uh, group that gets assigned the word leader is white men. So if you think about the agreements that we have in our society, as a society, we've agreed that white men are leaders. So if you think about business and you think about diversity and inclusion and you think about all of these things kind of coming together, part of the challenge is, is that we don't see, collectively, we don't see anyone else as a leader. So until we start to deconstruct and dismantle white supremacy, and again, we're not talking about sheets and hoods and burning crosses, we're talking about the societal agreement that we have that white is excellence, and that's the measure or the standard by which everyone is going up against. So when I think about um, another, just another part of this, and James brought it up, is about listening and going to the experts. I think it's super important that people are listening to people who have an experience. And part of what that does is it humanizes people because I think a part of the origin, or not the origin, but part of what is so challenging about being black in America is that um, there's a dehumanization of our experience and there's a dehumanization of the struggle in which we, we go through. So I believe that corporate America is one way that we can help to educate people because people are working, right? Corporate America is a, is a structure that we're collectively a part of. But we also have to keep in mind that the great equalizer is law enforcement. So for us, we have to, again, think about the things that we need in corporate America, belonging, all of those things. But we also need to dismantle those systems that prevent us from belonging and from really um, being a, a full contributing partner and our a full contributing participant in the American dream. So I know I went all places there, but um, oh. I've got a lot to say about this topic. <laughs> well, and I think it's it's multifaceted, right? I mean, and you've done a great job of just sharing that there's not sort of this one sort of lane. You've got to look at all these different pieces and parts that are making the you know making this up. And so that's really I appreciate that you went in, in those directions. I, I also thought it was interesting when you talked about. Um, you know, white supremacy and leaders and that in this exercise that you do, 
you know, leaders equal white men. Um, you know, we were, I was talking to a friend who's an HR leader and she said, you know, as I look at my organization, if I just holistically took a snapshot, it would look very diverse. But if I start to look at it in different ways and I look at leaders and particularly in our more senior leadership, it doesn't look so diverse. It looks one way and it looks very much like white men. And so somewhere I know I've got a broken process and, I, and I'm looking to, to see, and we were just talking about sort of this idea of how do I start to start to fix that? Um, and so I'm going to kind of then transition that into to Jennifer and thinking about some of the, the work that, that you all do and maybe answering this, this question as well. Uh, so the answers that you've gotten so far have been awesome and, and you know, really meaningful. I think one of the challenges that we have is if you're on this call and what James and Aaliyah just said has made you uncomfortable, good. Um, part of the challenge that we're having right now is, is when we do notice and name, um, it, it forces us to really think about our notions of what, what is business, what is business leadership, what is, um, you know, building capacity in people, what, what does that really mean? We, we have one of the systemic challenges in organizations is that we have a sense that we're trying to build a meritocracy and that in building that meritocracy, there is such a thing as an objective position and that, that we can define leadership in a way that everyone can accomplish, right? Those are some of the basic tenets of building culture, building capacity, HR, you know, strategic partnership with business. And part of my professional background is culture transformation. I've done large scale culture transformations, digital transformations for Fortune 500, mid-market and even small companies. And, and one of the big challenges is that leaders say, hey, this is, this, that's all great. Like we want, we want those things to be better, but what really matters is, you know, efficiency and revenue numbers and, you know, productivity and, um, you know, profitability and reporting, particularly if you're publicly held, there's this separation that we think of between business, which has these objective measures, and I'm going to put objective in quotation marks, because that's part of what we're talking about. When we talk about systemic challenges, we're talking about the notion of objective measure and, and how that often is through the lens of subjectivity. It's through the lens of decades and in some, in some cases, hundreds of years of codified language. So when we look at business and we think, okay, where am I gonna spend my time and resources right now? We as business leaders have a tendency to prioritize the things that are closest to the business metrics that matter to our stakeholders, not our shareholders, our shareholders rather, not our stakeholders, our shareholders. So the people who are wanting that profit return, the people who are concerned about being paid or compensated or bonus. What one of the challenges is, and I think everyone on this panel would agree with this, and if you don't, please speak up, is that this is not an optional thing, right? This is not of the moment. This is not something that you say, wow, I'd really love to do that. That's absolutely the right thing to do. What we're all saying here is this is intimately connected to your business's ability to be flourishing in five years, to be profitable in five years, to have the right workforce in five years, to, to be inclusive, but also drive the financial metrics that make your business run. We're not trying to create a separation here. And one of the big challenges that I've seen in kind of my work around gender parity and also culture transformation is we often as leaders hold these things separate because this one's kind of squishy and hard to measure and scary and vulnerable and uncertain and uncomfortable. We don't really know what, so we're gonna retreat to the hard metrics, right? The hard business skills. What we're saying here is they're the same. This is ultimately a conversation about leadership and leadership is ultimately a conversation about performance. And if you don't have the right capacity, leadership capacity and definition of leadership in your organization, or if it's myopic, like Aaliyah was pointing at, which by the way, most organizations, it is myopic because we're all trained through the same language, then you're not gonna be able to pivot and sustain your business and grow and drive their outcomes for everyone. It's just not possible. Let me just jump in really quick. Yeah, yeah. So, with, with Center for Workforce Excellence, we do a head, heart, and hands model. So this is really a heart conversation. 
and what Jennifer is speaking to the you know the discomfort and it's soft and you know it's hard it's it's hard to measure that's that's part of why we've taken we've punted this for so long is because we have been able to kind of put it on the back burner and and again we can no longer however I do believe that there are some people who will just continue to keep hunting because of the, the difficult nature of it. And we're encouraging people to step in and to, to lead with your heart and to do something differently and to, to, to do more, to act faster, as I, I believe Brianna mentioned at the beginning of this. And I believe that there are going to be some people who are lagging in this effort because that's human nature. But I, I agree with Jennifer's comments. Um, just the philosophical underpinnings for sure like yes well and i think you just said something too it's kind of you know it's difficult in nature um and i think to tie that a little bit also to, to jennifer's point is this connectivity we see these things as very separate um mm -hmm. and so in having worked in organizations where you start to have this conversation and you start to say but we've got all these other things to do do we have time Right. And we, we aren't seeing them as as I go out to seek more revenue. This is part of that conversation and they should be hand in hand in this separation that I think, Jennifer, you were talking about is we haven't made that connection. And it's I think Elia, to your point, it's hard, it's squishy, it's uncomfortable. So I'm not going to even try to make that that connection as we start to think about it. So I think that's really interesting as you all brought that up. You know, Robin, if I could just in, I'd there, there was a comment I think uh, that was made about somebody saying I have I have two children at home or something to that effect. And in the the first organization that many of us lead is that one that's underneath our roof. And you want to be able to say that you were a good CEO of that organization that you led well in that organization. That if your children, if your nieces and nephews, whomever it is that you're responsible for, have the capacity to ask you where are you in this moment, do you have a decent answer? You, are you in a position where you say, I'm growing and I'm learning and I'm going to try to do what is best and right for these people to provide them an on-ramp to a better a better company, a company, better organization, better country than the ones that was left for us. It, and, and so the, the courage to do that is it has to sometimes come from those tougher conversations. When I look in the mirror intellectually, emotionally nude and say, where am I in this? Right. And each day I may have to revisit that. Some of us put affirmations up on our mirrors in order to help push us one day at a time. And, and this is the kind of effort that is going to require perhaps a daily uptick for us, a daily check in for us, a daily look into the, the eyeballs of the little people that we're making cereal for to say, uh, I'm doing in part, I'm doing this for you because I don't know what the heck I'm doing right now. But I know that if I got to fall, I'm going to fall forward on my face instead of falling backwards as I have in the past. And if you can make it past that to your team members, to your board members, to your executive team, to whomever it is, great. That's fantastic. But where we start is important. So I suggest for those of us that are still just dipping a toe in the water, the first person you got to influence and lead is the person in the mirror. And you got to be able to convince her or him or them that you are doing this for the best kinds of reasons. And secondarily to that, the people that surround you and look up to you literally, and they need you to create a better space and a better organization, a better family for them. So to the extent that you are struggling to try to figure out the why, look in the mirror. If you're still struggling, look across the dinner table and ask yourself, are you doing all that you can in today's moment to take the information that you have access to, not just in these webinars, because there's a whole lot of stuff that you can get for free on the Google, as my grandmother calls it, to make yourself <laughs> smart as it relates to all of this. And it's and, and take that data that you get, and then you can process it through the people that are raising their hand and say, hey, I'll help you out with some of this. But I promise you, well, for me, when people, in the, even in my diversity friends, i got some white guy diversity friends, some white lady diversity friends, some black folk diversity friends. If you come to me unprepared for a deep and substantive conversation, I take it as a borderline insult. The least you can do is go read something and come, let's talk about that. I, I, my, I may not be prepared today to talk to you and educate you from zero to 100. But man, if you come to the table with two and a half, let's go to 10 together, right? So do your part to make your world better. Mirror first and the people across from the dinner table. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's so that's I mean, it's such a great point. And it's um, and it's hard. Right. I mean, you just expose something that's really hard um, and and challenging and vulnerable and all of those things. So we start to your point. We started this conversation at what are you doing and how are you having this at the organization level? Well, sometimes I think it's harder to have that conversation at a personal level. I think, you know, to do those things that you're talking about and to move from zero to two and two to five, you know, then you feel more equipped to go have that in your business environment. But if you're not doing it at home, back to, again, separation, and you're not making all of those connections, it becomes really hard. I, I think that's such a great point. Thanks for, for bringing that up, too. All right. I, well, I just want to jump in really quick and, and yeah. make a suggestion. And, yeah. and both Aaliyah and James have mentioned this, and I think Robin touched on it as well, is we often let fear and discomfort, but particularly fear, stop us. So if you are someone who looks like me and you are in conversations or being asked to do certain things or wanting to lead in a certain way and you have a fear that's very real, I want to acknowledge that's real, but also one of the most effective ways to interrogate the nature of that fear, and this is, this is really um, you know, reinforcing what James said, is ask yourself, what is it that you're really afraid of? Like, what is the conceit of that fear? Because one of the things that we say is, well, I, I don't wanna do it wrong. Well, but what does that actually mean, right? What is it that you're actually afraid of? And name that because whether it's talking about diversity and inclusion or talking about other things, when we start to name the, the motivators of the fear, we start to uncover the emotional state inside ourselves. And, and we stop reacting and we start being proactive. And that is a very strong toolkit, whether we're talking about very difficult topics like culture transformation, which is ultimately what this is, or if you're talking about a potential promotion or advancement for yourself, there's a whole host of ways that this shows up. But asking yourself and encouraging your managers, your team members, your employees who are expressing that to really unpack that for themselves too, because we know that high emotional intelligence is crucial for these initiatives. And emotional intelligence is the ability to identify your own emotions and manage those emotions and identify emotions in others and help influence and respond to those and meet people where they are. And so I want to just reinforce what James said about looking in the mirror. Name that fear, not just what you're afraid. I'm afraid of doing it wrong. What's the conceit of that? I'm afraid people will judge me. They'll think that I'm racist. They'll think that this is happening. My, my career will be impacted. And, and really calling that out and then acknowledging, again, if you look like me, that the feeling you're feeling now may be new to you, but it is not new to many of the people on your team. It is not new to Aaliyah and James on this panel. It is not new to other leadership. And, and that's part of that growth process, really understanding the emotional space that this is in as well. I think and if you think about um, the question that we sort of asked, kind of the why are you here and, and kind of the business side of this and what are you know businesses starting to do and, and we're getting a little bit more into that, you know, and some of the just in the conversations that, that I've been in, um, when you start to open up the conversation or you start to have this, people say, Well, wait, why why do you want to talk about that as a business? Isn't that back to something you should have in your home? Right? That's not something we should cross into this line. Um, what happens because now you're getting into politics or now I'm going to become, you know, what if someone says something that's inappropriate or, or, you know, politically incorrect if we open up this conversation? So maybe we shouldn't open up this conversation. I'm just curious as you all, I'm, I'm assuming you all have heard these comments and questions and things before. How do you respond to that? So if I'm sitting on this call, I'm an HR leader. I may not be the leader of the organization, but I'm in here and I want to start to help my company have this conversation, but I, I'm being faced with some of those as, as rebuttals. What do I do about that? How do I respond? So I think being mindful of the, you know, being mindful of the environment in which you're in is absolutely critical. And we are all in some ways protecting something. And it's important to make sure that you have buy-in 
So having a conversation with those who are higher up, if someone has put out a letter or something like that, you actually have a great opportunity to have this conversation. Also looking at an organization's core values, there was a client that we were just doing a proposal for, and one of their core values happens to be diversity and inclusion. Well, it's a perfect pivot point. So what are you espousing? What is it that you stand for as an organization? And that can sometimes help to have the conversation. Again, this is a conver this again is a conversation about humanity. And even though it's hard, it really is about um, it, it's about the survival of a very important group to this to this country. So I think um, one getting buy-in from those who are higher up, using something that you already have in your organization as a pivot point. You know, do we it maybe diversity and inclusion isn't called out as a core value, but maybe um, we're family is a core value. Well, if someone in your, in your family is having a hard time, you have a conversation about it. And getting through the, um, also getting permission from people like, hey, this is going to be very messy. And creating the conditions so that people can be honest, that will be the point in which people are going to have to move on. And I'm not at all a legal person, so you, people would have to, I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney, so people would have to find out in their organization what is permissible. But again, I say start with core values, start with getting buy-in, and also remember that this is, this is not a conversation, as Jennifer said, that we can, we, we can avoid. It, it's, it's not that anymore. It's, it's no longer an option, and we do have to thread this conversation into all the fabric of our, our, our organizations. And Jennifer mentioned stakeholders. Part of, and I'm just going to go on a little tangent for a second, part of an effective diversity and equity and inclusion strategy really does involve all of your stakeholders. And it means that as an organization, you're looking at the needs of the community, your employees, your vendors, your, if you're getting, uh, if you're, you're working with government, any regulation, any regulators, et cetera. So this conversation has to be really fully threaded in. And when we start thinking about it really systemically, then it, it loses some of the emotion, even though it is a hard conversation. You know, one of the, the, the benefits of being on a panel, you don't have to do all the heavy lifting in one of the panels, right? So I, I, get, to, uh, I, I, I get to just sort of be on the honor ramp with, with, with Jennifer and Leah, and um, to the point that uh, being uncomfortable is critical. Hopefully all of us are a little uncomfortable. Let, let me nudge you a little closer to the edge and say that when Jennifer talks about naming the fears, she rattled off a few potential fears. Let me plant one in your lap and, and, and strap in if you're not perhaps fully prepared and hold on to something, because the fear might be that you did something that was racist, right? That you, maybe not on purpose, I mean, you might be a decent person, good for you, but you may have done something to someone that was not nice, i.e. racist, Maybe, and by extension, maybe your company has a series of policies and practices that are racist or sexist or ist in a variety of ways. And that's who your organiza organization is today. That's who you might be today. But you don't have to stay there. You can move one tick towards something else to be non-racist, to be actively uh, 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 anti-racist, right? So these are all probabilities. So when you look in the mirror, one of those things might be, maybe I didn't hire her because she was a little too, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, she just wasn't a good fit. Mm, her hair was too African. Her name was had too many syllables that looked interesting to me, right? The, that, that might be your fear. And I believe that, that we are put on the planet and our organizations are built to do more than make widgets and make money. We have to be in part of here to make the world a better place. And so if you think that that's your job as a person, if you think that that's your job as a professional, if you think that that is your job as an organization, then part of what you need to do is unpack some of those potential things that you did that weren't nice to people. I've had to raise my hand a few times and say, I, I, I learned that I said or did something that was not okay. It was a Cuban professor in New York that checked me one time and said, James, you know what? We were talking about patriarchy. You know what? If everybody in the world was black, you'd be hyperprivileged. How do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to own that. I didn't do anything to be male, but I sure as heck have benefited from it, mm -hmm. right? 
So I have to recognize that in some ways I have privilege. And as a result of my own privilege and the patriarchy that exists, I may have, have, have executed on tactics, uh, techniques, processes, and policies, and maybe even built some that disadvantaged a group of people. All right, now that I know that, what am I gonna do about that? And that's what I'm asking and sharing with you. Now that you know, now that the mirror has shared with you that you have done some things, engaged in some things, built some things that disadvantaged a group of people strictly because of the color of their skin or because of the gender that they have or because of who they love or whatever the case might be, what are you gonna do about it, right? You all that are on this call, all of us have been blessed with a certain kind of uh, perhaps economic or organizational power and authority. What are you gonna do about it? Get smarter, make some better decisions, develop some better processes, unpack some of the systemic racism that may exist in your organization, right? That's how we make a difference one step at a time. I'm gonna jump in real quick. Yeah. So I, I love what, what yeah. James and Aaliyah just said. I'm gonna jump in real quick with a resource recommendation um, because as James and Aaliyah both uh, mentioned there is a lot of great resources or there are a lot of great resources out there and that we can self um, select and choose and use the Google and or whatever DuckDuckGo whatever version of that is cool with you um, especially around the idea of white leaders white team members white you know executives expressing discomfort around this, expressing um, hesitancy and fear and those kinds of things. One of the things that I would encourage you to research and read up on is the term white fragility. Now you might have just had a reaction to that term. That's okay. Um, that means you need to learn more about it. And, and one of the things that as HR professionals and business leaders, we need to be aware of is where our arsenal of responses come from. So when we are navigating staff challenges and leadership capacity building and those kinds of decisions, we're pulling from a set of resources, assumptions, and, and remedies, interventions as professionals and models. And one of the things that, that the notion of white fragility attacks and talks about is the centering of white feelings. And so the part of what Aaliyah was referring to earlier when she was talking about white supremacy and how that gets institutionalized as leadership um, and, and how you know, cisgendered white males end up being the avatar for leaders. Um, part of this is also HR policies are often written with the idea that this objective measure of emotional status, it, they're written that way, not overtly, but they are, they are institutionalized with the idea that the white experience as the majority is more important. So their discomfort is policed in a different way. So part of what I, I encourage you as an HR expert to do is to do some research about what that means, how that can be a poison to everything else you do as a DEI as an HR leader, a, HR, a DEI leader, as an HR leader, as a person, because what it does is it says, me functionally as a white woman, my, my discomfort, my personal guilt about potentially, you know, being racist in certain situations or feeling indicted is more important than Aaliyah and James's experience. It is more important than the discomfort of our black and, and indigenous and people of color, staff, leaders, colleagues, friends, family members. And that is something that is institutionalized in this country. That is a part of white supremacy. It is not something that you wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna do this on purpose. It's how you're, it, it, is, it bleeds into our bones in this country because that is the language we speak. And so I would encourage you to go do that research. There's some great resources out there. Google it, there are some great resources for you. You know, the extent to, the extent to which, um, like, white fragility is a thing, right? You flip it on its head. What is that, right? What is the opposite of white fragility? And the extent that folk have been running from trying to understand that is folk have been running from trying to recognize that the reverse is true, too. You fill it in for yourself, listener, attendee. Opposite of white is what? Opposite of fragile is what? You know how strong Aaliyah must have to be to talk to her children about you got to be at 10 and 2 when the police stop you. And she has to instill that 
into that young person when they're 15, nine months, almost 16. You must know this. I, I've been stopped by the police, I don't know, somewhere in about three dozen times, something like that. And I think about the guys who weren't strong enough to make it through the 15th police stop and they lost it. They never, they didn't have to be that strong. They should have never had to be that strong. That, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. And how much did your business lose because you didn't get the intellectual gravitas of that potential employee? Because they lost it when they got stopped for only the 15th time. Thank goodness I can make it to 32. Mm -hmm. Right? So if white fragility is the thing, then you have to know, you have to begin to believe that black strength is the thing and not to be feared, right? Not to be, not to run from, but to recognize that it exists, mm -hmm. right? Because this, 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 this is not a one-off thing. All of these things are connected. The systems are connected. And if we recognize that one is there, the other is there. And I, I, I don't know what it feels like to be white and hear somebody say black strength on a, on a, on a webinar or a podcast. I don't know what that's about. Right. So I respect it. I may have just poked you an eyeball in love, in love. But I, I think that we have to do this together. That you, I can recognize that you are fragile and you can recognize that I am strong at the same time. Right. We, we, we can we can do things together. And, and I'm not saying that your white fragility makes you a terrible person. And you're not saying that my black strength makes me a black bad person. It means that we can meet somewhere in the middle. We can develop something that's really interesting and beautiful and strong together, right? So I'll stop there. And I think this is good. I mean, I think we've got this. This the question, and, and while I didn't ask it in the same way, I think we've we've gone about the, you know answering this in a lot of different ways. And and I just want to make sure that that I've captured sort of some of the things that you all said. So if we think about we know what the problem is. What can we do about it? Well, some of the things I've heard you all say, which have been very powerful are you know this this idea of looking internally um you just said recognize was a, a word that I, I kind of picked up acknowledge um you know that we've got the, these differences and that we're looking at things from maybe one point of view so that gets into education how do i look at this from a broader perspective um and what do i think on it and then make sure that as we go through this that that we're naming it and we're understanding it and i think as we talked about organizations in the conversation that we also understand the organization and that we can bring it in a way that can be consumed as a little bit i think of what i heard you saying Aliyah. is like we don't want to ignore it we're not going to walk away from it i'm going to bring it to you but i'm going to understand your consumption and be so that i can continue on and have that that conversation sound i mean very simplified into and certainly not as eloquent in all of the great details that, that you all had um but again some things that maybe as as the the audience starts to think about what can they do what they can do next so um, maybe we, because I know we're, um, we just have a few minutes, maybe Brianna, we move um, to, to just thinking about um, D&I and the fabric of a company and how does it, we've talked a little bit about this, but how does it really become, so we know that you've got to have a strategy in place. And we've talked, you know, kind of talked about that a little bit, I think around the, the edges. Um, and, and we talked a little bit, maybe as you think about how does it become a fabric is maybe as you all kind of think about your answers, thinking about too is, um, what what prevents it from doing that? So how does it become that, or maybe what prevents it becoming in our fabric? Um, I'm going to start with you, Aaliyah, if that's okay. So I want to just really quickly, the last question that you just asked, it kind of ties into this, what do you do? So there are tangible things that you can do, and the first is listen. James mentioned it right away. We've got to listen to the people who are impacted the most because we're all impacted in some way, but we've got to listen to the people who are impacted the most. Um, I think it's important to get experts on whatever topic it is you're exploring. For example, I'm not going to go to a podiatrist because I have a GI issue, okay? So it's, it's, it's very similar, like go to the people who know and be willing to accept their um, prescription are their, their proposal to help you get to wherever is next. So that, that's one big thing is, is, is listening, trusting experts and listening, not just to experts, but also to the people who this impacts. So um, how does the DNI become the fabric of the company? You have to think about all of your stakeholders. There's a great model. So conscious capitalism is an organization I've been involved with for over a decade. And I like, um, 
I like a lot of the tenets of what they talk about, and they talk about a stakeholder perspective instead of a shareholder perspective. And in a stakeholder perspective, you really are in, you really are thinking about the needs of everybody. So what does my community need? What do my employees need? What um, again, if you're regulated by government, what does the government need for me? Um, so we've got to very well. We have to be intentional about how we weave. Uh, diversity and inclusion into a fabric and how you do that is through listening focus groups getting experts um, educating yourself looking in the mirror as james said because when you have gotten your own um, knowledge base you can have a different conversation like james said come prepared you can have a very different conversation even with an expert because your level of learning and your level of absor absorption will be impacted something else that you can do is look at the numbers so diversity, diversity and inclusion has become this fun check the box exercise that we're like, we, for the people like to be comfortable. That's just the way, it's human nature. We like to be comfortable. And people will, will put, a lot of companies will put the, oh, we're very diverse. I actually did a keynote for a company, another tech, tech company back in October, and they were like, we are so diverse. I don't know what their measuring stick was, but it was definitely inadequate. But they were diverse based on what they were comfortable with. They had um, they had a, a, a pretty pretty well balanced men and women ratio. They had quite a few minorities, but again, it was it was how they were com what they were comfortable with. So we also have to be honest with ourselves that this should not this should no longer be a check the box exercise. We need to go a little deeper. And I loved again Brianna's words at the beginning. We've got to do something differently. We've got to do more, and we've got to act faster. Um, I can go on and on with solutions mm -hmm. because I'm a, I'm a solutions person, but I'll stop there to give some people some more space. So we've um, about before we, sorry to interrupt Robin, before we throw that question over to Jennifer and James, I wanted to just add in some things that are related to this question that we got from the audience. Um, one of the questions is DNI works when leaders tie it to performance and rewards and recognition. How do you address this when business leaders do not want to tie DNI to compensation rewards, et cetera? Um, so that to me sounds like it's not in the fabric. So that's that's you know part of this question. How do we change that? And then you know, another comment I got is obviously this this discussion applies, racism applies to all races. Um, so any anything you would add around that, um, because diversity is about is about everybody. So I just I'd like to hear uh, Jennifer and James your thoughts on those two things. James, go ahead. Sure. So <clears throat> let me start with the last question first. That there that diversity is about all races or all groups. I think if we're not careful, we can get slippery and slip right off the point. Right. So that's not to say that the other groups are not important. It is to say that if we address the biggest issue, we can make a lot of traction on the mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. I had a Latinx friend say to me, well, I didn't see all these protests and riots happening when you were locking up our babies down south of the border. Right. And I was like, you know, that's a really good point. Right. I, I, I got to you, you got you get to be upset about that. I'm upset about that. And you're correct that there wasn't the same kind of reaction when that was transpiring. Let's not allow the, the this what we might perceive as a different uh, topic to supersede the overlapping Venn diagram of our issues. Right? That there is a lot that we can accomplish together. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the the what do they call it? The uh, the historic sin, all right. The big, big sin of, of of the United States is this slavery issue, and if we and this race issue, if we can unpack that, we will develop skills and policies and practices that will impact across the range of diversity. We will get smarter about talking about race and diversity. We become more expert about talking about race and diversity. We'll have stronger and bigger muscles, if you will, to talk about all of these issues. It will make it easier to talk about GLBTQ issues if we can deal with race slash black issues. It will make it easier to talk about the Asian issues, the Hispanic and Latinx issues, all versions of immigration across the board. If we can get stronger around the issue of race and slavery, if you will, racism and systemic racism. We have to get stronger around it. So let's do what is hard. I believe it was Mark Twain said, if you eat a live frog for breakfast every morning, 
right? There's nothing worse than what happened to you uh, throughout the day. Meaning, do what is hardest first. We have been avoiding the harder topics, the hard S topics for a long time, right? So I think that you have to acknowledge that there is absolutely pain and depravity and, and um, challenges that exist in other spaces, but that we can all win by lifting what is heaviest first together. Right. Jennifer, well, we I are going to very very give you the last word. Yeah, here. So you can that. Oh, sorry. I just down. wanted to jump in quickly and address a, another part of the question that, that Brianna read off from the audience about tying business incentives to DEI initiatives and the reluctance to do that. Um, DEI of any type needs sponsors. So this can't be something that's pushed from the bottom. So you need to recruit executive leaders and the conversation to be had is not we need to do this because it's the right thing to do. Although it is, that is not, I'm not disputing that. You have to present this as an HR or DEI executive as to, as a business imperative. And there are lots of studies out there that show that this is directly tied to very specific business outcomes, whether it's the ability to innovate, pivot in a crisis, drive financial performance, increase profitability, reduce um, uh, waste and, and costs and, and uh, expenses. So part of this is, is to call it what it is and then tie it to the impact that you're looking for, and then measure the progress just like you would any other strategy, is that when we have more diverse leadership throughout an organization at all levels, involvement, more, in, more inclusion, right? It's not just the seat at the table, it's a voice at the table that actually can affect change. These are often conversations around things like sponsorship and mentorship. Right. This is not a huge performance gap that we're trying to teal. Well, if only that, you know, our black staff were better at blah or only our women were better at negotiation or blah. This is not that the, the, the data out there shows that it says this is access to authority and power and systemic institutionalized issues. So what I would encourage you to do is to get really like really overt about the business metrics that you're driving and use this as a strategy to drive those metrics because that's the language that leadership worries about. They're worried about profitability. They're worried about how that ties, that's how you tie stakeholders to shareholders, which is ultimately the motivator for most businesses. Thank you, Jennifer. I think that's the, the perfect way to leave this conversation because I was seeing things in the chat uh, really about the buy-in piece of this. Like if, if the people on the call are on board how do they get other leaders on board with them to really make change in business? So I think that's a really great place to start and focus some energy. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, Aaliyah, James, and Robin for moderating. This was a really great discussion and I know our audience appreciated it because of the things I was seeing in the chat. So thank you so much um, and everyone on the call, I hope to see you next time. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.